Okay, welcome to the Doctors Investing Group podcast. We have a very special guest for you today. We have Monish Pabrai. Monish is the founder and managing partner of Pabrai Investment Funds and CEO of Dondo Funds. Uh, the funds have over $500 million in assets under management and are unique in that they have no management fee. He is internationally known in the investment community, not only for his outperformance, but for his investment style, which is a value-based approach. Mr. Pabrai is the author of The Dondo Investor, which is a heads I win, tails I don't lose much philosophy to investing. He has been recently featured in the book Richer, Wiser, Happier by financial author William Green. And last but not least, Mr. Pabrai is an educator. He has been donating his time to business schools and groups like ours to educate and share his investing experience. Um, we're so grateful to have him. So Monish Pabrai, welcome to the show. Tom, it's a pleasure to be with you, and I'm looking forward to the, to the session. Can you start by telling us your story, starting a company and then transitioning from that to a professional investor? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, uh, I had started my, uh, uh, my first business in uh, 1990. I was about 25 years old at the time, and uh, it was a uh, IT services system integration company. And uh, uh, about four years after I started, and that company grew uh, very fast. Uh, about four years after I started, I accidentally heard about Warren Buffett for the first time. And uh, I had picked up a book by Peter Lynch, and then he was talking about this guy Buffett in reverential terms. And then I decided to look up who Buffett was. And I was lucky because uh, the first couple of biographies on Buffett had just come out in 92, 93. So I could read those and then that led me to the shareholder letters. And then that opened up a whole big world for me to try to get my arms around. It. And um, I was really uh, blown away by a number of things about Warren when I read about him. Uh, the main thing that puzzled me then was that his investment approach made a lot of sense to me. But when I looked at uh, professional investors, and at that time, the only professional investors I could look at were mutual funds. When I looked at the way mutual funds were run, they were diametrically opposite to the way he was suggesting investing should be. So he was saying, you make very few bets, uh, the big bets, the infrequent bets, and, uh, and you hold them for a while and you're not buying a stock, you're buying a business. Etc. And uh, mutual funds, most of them had 100% annual turnover, which means the entire portfolio was being turned over every year. They had, in some cases, hundreds of positions and at a minimum, you know, several dozen positions. So, and then that called into question how could they know so many businesses so well and so on. So, everything I saw about Warren and the way he was suggesting things happen the way I saw the mutual funds doing it was different. So I had an idea at that time that if someone followed Buffett's approach to investing, it didn't seem like a lot of the professionals wanted to go that way, then uh, that person would have a clear advantage because they apparently didn't, didn't seem to be many people doing it that way. And uh, any kind of idea like that doesn't really have much merit without execution. And so I said, okay, Monish, you have this idea, that's fine, but you know, you need to actually test it out in the real world and prove to yourself that it works. And I had just sold a portion of my business. The first time I had money, I had a million dollars in my account after taxes. And I said, okay, I can take the million and try to invest it with Buffett's approach. And I started to do that. And um, that went really well. I think by the time it was like 99, 2000, it had grown past 10 million. So it had gone up like you know 70% a year or something. So it worked uh, way better than I thought. And of course, there was a strong bull market at the time, which gave some tailwinds, but uh, it was significantly about the market as well. So as I pursued that, I got more and more interested in investing and less and less interesting in my IT business. It had become large, a lot of HR problems. and I wasn't enjoying it as much as I did 
when it was just ramping up. And, uh, and so a few friends of mine had suggested that I manage money for them. I used to give them stock tips and they had done well, but they thought that was pretty random. So Pabrai funds really started in 99 as a hobby for me to manage funds for eight of my friends. And it just started with $1 million. Uh, you know, everyone put in like 100 or 200,000 type money and, uh, and I put in 100,000. And, uh, it's really about a, about a year, year and a half after that. When I said, you know, I think I ought to really not treat this like a stepchild and uh, should really try to build a business here because I really enjoy it. And in the meantime, I had uh, transitioned out of the IT business, I brought an outside CEO, and then the business got sold. So that freed me up to, to just focus on this. And that's how I then morphed into an investor professionally. And you learned this from Warren Buffett and the kind of value investing philosophy. Can, can you help define that? What, what does value investing mean to you? And can you tell us how you approach learning it? Yeah, I mean, I think you either get it in five minutes or you're never going to get it. I think it's basically buying things for well below what they're worth. And so the first part of the equation is that if you're looking to make an investment in an asset and you had mentioned real estate, you know, let's say you were looking to buy an, a rental apartment. I mean, you would look at the rent and the expenses and what would be the net amount coming to you every month. And if you had a property that was going to give you after everything a thousand dollars a month or twelve thousand dollars a year, then the question is, uh, what is that worth? You know, what, what do you think that's worth to you? And it's, it's worth different things to different people because there's different opportunity costs. But if you're looking for a, for a 10% return on your money, then you wouldn't want to pay more than a hundred or 120,000 for the property, right? Because that would give you about a 10% return. And if you wanted a 20% return, then you wouldn't want to pay more than 60,000. Right. The threshold you set determines whether, and for some other investor, maybe 5% is enough. And for them, if they got the property for 200,000, they think it's a great deal. Right. So, and of course, if you're going to leverage it, take a loan, et cetera, then that changes the equation because then you look at the interest rate you're paying there. And then you look at your equity component and what return you're getting on that. And that can make you pay a somewhat higher multiple depending on the loan rates and so on. And, and investing in equities or stocks is very similar. I mean, basically, you need to have an idea of what the asset is worth versus what you're paying for it. And how long do you think it would take for the market to converge on what you think is the value of the business? And, uh, and, Usually, I think what you want to do in investing is go for the complete no-brainers, you know, where you don't need an Excel spreadsheet, you don't even need a calculator. You can do the math in your head and you know it's going to work great. How can you efficiently learn to evaluate a business? Is it as simple as a discounted cash flow calculator or how can we learn to find the true value of a business? Yeah, so I think the first, the first question one should focus on is, is whether the business is within your circle of competence. You know, and uh, so if, if I lived in Des Moines, Iowa, and, you know, I had expertise in buying and selling apartments in Des Moines, Iowa, then... I would have a general sense of, you know, when something came up on the radar and the price of being offered at, whether it was a good deal or not. Just because I could, I'd know how to run the numbers and the equity and the financing and the expenses and all of that and make a determination. So the first question is to uh, ask yourself, is the business within my circle of competence? The same Des Moines investor may have no expertise in London real estate, for example, or even Florida real estate, for example. They may be factors 
that come in that he may not be familiar with, or it may be very similar. We don't know. So, first thing you need to satisfy yourself is that whatever business or stock or asset you're looking at is something you understand well, and if you understand it well, then you know how to value it. And if you can value it, then the next step is you know is there a difference between the price is being offered and what you think it's worth. And if there's a large enough difference there, then you would generally step in. And if it's, if that difference is negative or minuscule, then you would just move on. Can you comment about index funds versus individual stock picking for say, you know, busy professionals? Is it reasonable to think that someone who has an interest in investing can go out and learn how to value a business? And, and therefore should go out and buy individual equities? Well, I think uh, index investing is a great way to go for almost all of us. I think that if you venture into individual stocks, two or three things come into play. The first is, you know, the circle of competence. You know, so there may be, I mean, you mentioned you're an ER doctor. So there may be certain things that you're very familiar with. Or you may, like, you know, you may be a frequent customer of Walmart and you may understand how the Walmart business works or Costco or whatever. So there are certain things you encounter in life or you might be using an Apple phone and you might think you might understand that business. So if you think you understand the business well, then, and if you had the time, then you could dig in and see whether that investment makes sense or not. But if you don't have the time then I think you're better off just not going there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that makes a lot of sense. Uh, We're going through a time where diversification seems to be the name of the game as the proposed method, and your funds have relative concentration to them, uh, sometimes just holding a few names. Uh, Tell us why this would be the case and give the positives and negatives to this kind of allocation strategy. Well, I mean, uh, the... The standard way I try to invest is what I call a 10 by 10 portfolio. So typically, I mean, if I have a fund that has 100 million, for example, what I'm ideally looking for is 10 bets that are $10 million each. Uh, That's what I'm looking for. And if I were able to find 10 bets, 10 million each, you know, if they're in a few different industries and geographies and maybe countries, that's plenty diversified. One can be quite diversified with just four stocks. I mean, I was just listening to Charlie Munger. He was talking at the Daily Journal meeting which was just taking place. And he was saying, look, the Munger family has their money in Berkshire, Costco, a Chinese investment manager, Li Lu, and uh, some apartment house. Right. And within Berkshire, there's like more than a hundred businesses. So that itself is, and of course, the bulk of their fortune, I think, is Berkshire. Probably maybe 80% or something is Berkshire. And yeah, if you, if you had that type of a construction of a portfolio, that is plenty diversified. It's giving you enough different things going on there. And so I think that a know nothing investor, who buys the S&P 500 is getting more than that. It's getting more than 10 stocks. But then the, but the S&P itself also, you know, uh, top five or top 10 positions, maybe a third of the fund or a quarter of the fund. And so it's more diversified than you would normally look for, but you don't pay a heavy price for that. And it's a simple index. It's a broad index. You can invest in it cheaply. And so, not a bad way to go. Onish, you are a self-proclaimed uh, shameless cloner. Uh, tell us about shameless cloning. What is this philosophy and are you still practicing it today? Yeah, I think uh, shameless cloning is a good way to go. So as a professional investor, the universe of stocks to look at is very large. Globally, there are more than 50,000 publicly traded companies. And 
there's no any way there's no way anyone could even look at 50000 companies in any reasonable amount of time maybe even over a lifetime that will not be possible so the first thing you would do is you would get rid of all the businesses that are outside your say a circle of competence and that might get rid of 90% 95% of that universe it's still a large number you might still have like 5000 stocks 2000 stocks which is a large number so if you if you said that i will look at what other great investors have bought and what are their top positions investors you admire who done well in the past etc that cuts down the data set dramatically and not only does it cut down the data set dramatically it gives you a great pool to look at because it's already been through one filter by a great mind so if i say i want to look at what charlie munger is buying or what warren buffett's buying or what bill ackman is buying then those things would cull the universe down so i could look at that list and say okay which ones of these are within my circle of competence and not take them out and then i could also look at the ones which they have made their highest conviction bets so usually when you're cloning you want to look at the highest the biggest bets these individuals have made because they have the greatest conviction obviously and so it's already been through one mind it's been through all the filters to the point that they actually put real money to work significant money to work and then you're coming in to look at it from your lens and uh, so you're sending it to a second set of filters and a lot of things may not get through the second set of filters so i think it's a good way to it's kind of like you know you could bowl without bumpers and bowling might be more fun but your score is going to be lower or you could bowl with bumpers and it's kind of cheating but you do better so when you do shameless cloning it's kind of like bowling with bumpers except it's all legal <laughs> can you tell us about your philosophy with spawners this is something we've heard in many of your recent interviews um what are spawners and how do you find them yeah so i think there are there are some businesses that have a dna which allows them to enter new businesses and new markets and if you can look at a business that has done that successfully over some period of time then that gives you some some legs to stand on so you know the nature of capitalism is that almost everything will eventually mature and die very few companies last for 30 years or 50 years or 70 years and so on but if a company has the ability to spawn new businesses or invest in new businesses then they can transcend so their older bets may make them a lot of money for 10 20 30 years and then by the time they are dying they will be got four other engines that are doing well so for example if i look at a, at a business like amazon i never liked their book business and their retail business and especially the the book business where they took inventory of the books so they have two businesses one is the marketplace where they are you know using third party sellers and just providing the logistics and payments and so on or they have their own products and they are both the marketplace business to me is a lot better because they are kind of like a di- digital intermediary and the margins are there i think when they take ownership of the inventory and run it through their warehouses and all that i've always been skeptical how profitable that is i mean if if i order you know some you know let's say i order some deodorant or something from amazon or some batteries from amazon you know 5 dollar 10 dollar purchase i don't believe they can make profit on that delivering it to me the next day or the day after with you know it's in a warehouse it goes on a truck then it goes on a smaller truck and then a delivery guy is coming to my place 
I mean, uh, FedEx cannot deliver a package for less than 20 bucks, you know. And uh, so that cost is up there. The cost is, it's a double digit cost, five, 10 bucks at least. It exceeds the cost of the product and shipping is free. So that business never appealed to me very much. And I don't think Amazon makes a lot of money on that business. But they use that business as a toehold to throw stuff against the wall and look at what sticks and what makes money. So they had the Amazon Fire Phone, for example, and they brought it out with a lot of fanfare and it did not get traction and they gave it a quick burial and they moved out and they moved on and they stumbled onto AWS and they spent many years, you know, keeping it quiet and secret and nurturing and growing it. And now AWS, I think, is responsible for the bulk of Amazon's market cap. Uh, AWS Amazon, uh, advertising and their marketplace, I think, is the bulk of the value of the business. And their own retail, I think, again, is the same. It's a difficult business, has all these extra costs and such. So Amazon has proven itself to be really good at spawning new businesses. They've gone into many, many new businesses and they continue to add new businesses. So for example, I believe at some point they'll be a competitor to UPS and FedEx. So Amazon's truck fleet, I think already is, is bigger than FedEx or UPS and, and their delivery scope is bigger. I recently uh, drove from California to Texas and I was relocating to Texas. So we just made a you know, road trip out of it. And just to keep myself from falling asleep, I decided to count the number of Amazon trucks I saw versus UPS trucks and FedEx trucks. And I saw way more Amazon trucks all the way. And just, that's just anecdotal evidence. And I think if you look at the numbers, it kind of bear itself out because uh, we have deliveries coming to us all the time. So they will enter at some point that business. They have a lower cost structure because UPS and FedEx have unionized workforce. And Amazon has a bunch of entrepreneurs running its vans. They're, they own the van and they're kind of paid per package kind of thing. And it's a completely different cost structure. So that's an, that's a business that didn't exist. It'll exist in the future. Uh, and they have a bunch of other businesses like that, that they've spawned or they bought like Whole Foods. So they are what I would call an apex spawn. And there are lots of other uh, companies. Most companies cannot and are not really good at going into new businesses. If you look at company like like Google, you know, every other new business they've gone into, they've acquired. They haven't gotten any traction of stuff coming out from within Google. Search came out from within Google, but they bought Android, they bought YouTube, they bought a lot of these, they bought DoubleClick, and so they bought most of the other pieces that uh, have have value. And their own initiatives like Waymo, et cetera, haven't gotten traction. So, so I think different companies have different DNAs. If you can find a business that has the spawning DNA and it can do it well, it can give you some great tailwinds. So it sounds like you would prefer the business that is able to design and implement a new technology and venture into new business rather than do it through acquisition. Is that right? No, both, both can work. I mean, I think when Facebook bought Instagram, or when Google bought YouTube, those are like the all-time best acquisitions ever. What they paid versus what they made them. So both can work. I think acquisitions is fine too. It's just a matter of, are they good at it? Are they good at sniffing out businesses that would be great acquisitions and then scaling them up? You know, and, and is their hit rate high? And if that's the case, then... and you know, do they understand uh, what their competence is? Like, are they good at, are they better at home growing businesses or better at nurturing acquisitions, right? So it, different companies have different competencies. So if they're good at those things, that can work out well, sure. Mm-hmm. 
the buzzword of uh, the day is inflation, and the Fed has just come out with a 7.5% year-over-year inflation rate. Uh, does that change your investing philosophy, Monish? And if so, how? Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't spend a lot of time on macro because I'm useless at it. I don't think I'm any good at predicting what future inflation. There's, there's a different schools of thought on inflation. There's a very strong view that these things were temporary because of supply chain hiccups and such we had in COVID and maybe a year, year or two from now, uh, we might be in a different place. So there are just different views on it. So who knows uh, which way it goes. But I think that if you, if you make investments where the margin of safety is very large, then I think whether inflation is 1% or 7% would tend to be a rounding error. And also there are businesses where inflation can be a tailwind. So, so let's say, for example, you, bo- you own a bunch of apartment houses, okay? And you're done. Your, your portfolio is there. You've already made the bets and all that. And you believe a lot of inflation is done. Well, your portfolio would do really well because your rents would rise with inflation, but your costs would, right? You already spent yesterday's dollars on the CapEx and the down payments and all of that, and you're collecting rent in tomorrow's dollars, which are inflation adjusted. So you're you're in good shape. Your asset is increasing in value and your fixed rate loans are actually worth less. The lender is getting screwed, uh, not you. And in that environment, you do well. Now, if, if you're going to be buying a lot of apartment houses in the future, then inflation can be a negative because now you'll have to pay up and who knows if rent can keep up or not and all of that. So that becomes an issue. I'll give you an example of investment I made where inflation is very extreme. And I knew it would be extreme. And I still made the investment. And it has worked out exceptionally well. And it will keep working out well. So I made it. And since you mentioned, I think you guys got started in real estate. I was in Turkey in 2019. uh, My second trip to Turkey. Istanbul, great place. I just spent three weeks there. And um, I visited a business where... The market cap was $20 million. And I was told that the liquidation value of the business was more than $800 million. And so this was a company that had 12 million square feet of warehouse space in 82 different warehouses around Turkey. A lot of it was in Istanbul because... 40% 40% of the GDP of the country are around Istanbul, but it was spread out all over the country. And they had a bunch of other businesses besides this. That 12 million square feet was 99% leased, long-term 10-year leases. And the tenants were blue chip tenants, Amazon, Ikea, Carrefour, just awesome tenants. And the leases were inflation index. So every year, the rents went up based on changes to the CPI. And um, so it took about 10 minutes to do the math. I never used the calculator. So there was 12 million square feet. The construction cost at that time in Turkey was about $40 a square foot. And the cost of the land, depending on where you were at, were between twenty and forty dollars a square foot. So, a constructed warehouse was between sixty and eighty dollars a square foot. So, if you took a, let's say, a seventy dollar average, for example, and then you multiplied it by seventy, so that's eight hundred and forty million. Okay, so. Without debt, that's the value. And, and a lot of their warehouses were in Istanbul, so it was skewed closer to 80 than 70 in terms of the actual price. 
and there was uh, 200 million of debt. So even if you took it at 840 million or 200 million debt, you have 640 million. And the market cap is 20 million. And so basically the market cap is sitting at something like uh, 3% of the liquidation value. And there were a bunch of other businesses on top of this business. But I didn't even care about the other businesses, but those were harder to value. And there was no debt on those businesses. So those were pure assets. Like they run the largest freight train network in Turkey. It's a large business. They have about like 700 containers going back and forth between Turkey and Europe. And uh, they have the largest truck fleet in Turkey. And they have a forklift rental business. And they have these vehicle inspection stations that they have like a long-term contract. So there are a bunch of different businesses. They're all like monopoly or neo-monopoly businesses. At the time I invested, it was the lira had just devalued. It had gone from three lira bought you a dollar to five lira. And inflation was running rampant. The expectation was that future inflation would be 50% a year, five zero. As soon as I could satisfy myself that there was no fraud here and that the things where, I mean, I spent an afternoon visiting the warehouses and assuring myself that the CEO and father son team that ran it seemed completely above board to me and, and such. Uh, once I eliminated fraud risk, I just started buying every share I could. And uh, we own about 35% of the company. I was shocked that we were able to get that many shares. So $7 million bought us about 35% of the company, which we still owe. Inflation from 2019 to now is about probably 40, 50% a year. Okay. But like I told you the story of the, you know, owning a home, if there's inflation in the future and I'm not building more warehouses, my warehouses are going up in value. My rent is going up. Everything's going up. And so I can't lose. I, I can't go backwards. And so I said that I'm buying at 3%. And I don't think, I don't think there can be value destruction because if there's inflation, then cement prices go up, steel prices go up, land prices go up. Everything goes up and rents go up. Okay. And, um, what the company was really good at is in the middle, they got a chance to refi at lower interest rates. So Turkey is weird. They've kept their interest rates low, but inflation is running very high. So they, in the, from 2019 till 2022, the debt went from 200 million to 90 million. They paid off a lot of debt. And the blended interest rate is 14% on their debt. So they're getting 20, 20, 25% CPI increases because the government suppresses the CPI numbers to show that the inflation is lower. So inflation is really running at 50% and they only get about 25%, but their, their debt is at 14. So it doesn't matter. You know, they're still collecting and, and debt versus the value of the asset is almost nothing. Most of it is sitting in equity. And um, what they said is that they really get a market rent after 10 years with the tenant lease. Because in the meantime, you've got this suppressed increases in rent. So they're getting further and further away from the market rent. Finally, the tenant leaves after 10 years. And then they're able to uh, re-rent it. So there's a big shortage of warehouses. And so uh, so probably 15%, 20% of the footprint is at market rents. And a lot of the older leases are way below market. So every year, the rents keep going up. And which is great because the foot and the footprint, they're not able to expand it much because banks are unwilling to lend and, and things, which I like, but I just want them to stay with that footprint. And um, now uh, 90 million debt and they've spawned a new business. They are spawner. They, they started a solar business, which has added about 200 million to the intrinsic value. So the intrinsic value today in dollars is higher than it was in 2019. The lira has gone from five lira to the dollar when I invested to almost 14. Okay. So 
we got clobbered on the lira. The investment is now uh, the market cap is over a hundred million dollars. So the the it's still deeply undervalued, but it moved up about five times. Okay, so and it's still got a ro- lot of room to run. So what I'm saying is, we knew there was inflation. Like I know, I know already a year from now the lira will be at twenty, and I know two years from now it'll be at thirty, and I know the investment will still be. You know, no issues, and uh, and so that's an example of where seven percent interest uh, inflation is mixed up. You know, come play at fifty percent inflation, and and still keep your shirt on. So that business has done well, and they've been really smart about how they've you know used the bank debt. I mean, I think the banks get hosed, and the depositors get hosed. You, know, you don't want to be sitting on bank deposits. Bank paying you ten percent or something in that environment, but this that works out okay. It sounds like a big part of that success was the ability to raise rents for their uh, property, and then also just that giant margin of safety. And actually, my next question would be: How did you find it? Was this a, a publicly traded security, or was it a private it's, business? Uh, it's and- uh, it's publicly traded. It's still cheap. Nobody wants to. So every professional investor has exited Turkey. They got freaked out with the back job fiscal policies, and they all sold everything and they all left. I spent three weeks in Turkey. I think it's the most amazing market to invest in. So I only look at stuff where I just understand the inflation is there. So, for example, I mean, there's a I mean, I'm not going to invest in this company. Just to give you an example, there's a juice company in Turkey, publicly traded, very large packaged juices, and 98% of the product is exported. So their costs are in lira, and their revenue is in euro. And Turkey is part of the European Common Market, so all the exports go duty free all over Europe. So as the lira has depreciated, their input costs actually have gone down. Versus the euro, because the exchange rate that they convert to is so favorable, so wages have not kept up with inflation, and other costs have not kept up with inflation. So this particular business, for example, does really well in a high inflation environment. So in general, in Turkey, if you are a business where your revenue is in euros or dollars, and your expenses are in Turkish lira. Uh, a high inflation environment is not going to affect you, and a lot of devaluation is probably going to give you tailwinds. So, if I just limit myself to businesses which fit that equation, so even this this company I bought, Visa, a real estate company, a lot of their leases are euro leases. So then they just automatically, or you know, they don't even need to bother with the exchange rate because in lira it's so high, and uh, so. Basically, but but the thing is that professional investors look at it in you know broad swaths and say, oh, Turkey, bad economic policies, crazy macro environment, whatever else, we're way out of here. And when you have that type of mass exodus, you are going to get mass mispricing. And uh, so uh, I I found some businesses in Turkey that uh, I think. Uh, would not be hurt with inflation. They would not be hurt by devaluation, and um, they have a lot of tailwinds, and they're really cheap. So life is good. Do you just view this as an opportunity then to potentially acquire more shares or find other opportunities in that market? Yeah, we are buying every day. You have a focus on emerging markets in general, like India and and Turkey, for example, um, as well as China. Um, and investors here in the U.S. seem to have some fear over these markets. Um, for instance, China. Uh, most recently, can you, could you talk about that and what what attracts you to uh, foreign markets? Well, I think I think you're better off not being too jaundiced about where the company is based. And I think to really look for really well-run businesses, 
with great leaders, which have the ability to withstand any headwinds that their locations will produce. Right. So this, this real estate company in Turkey, if its market cap went to a billion dollars tomorrow above its liquidation value, I gave you liquidation value. I did not give you intrinsic value. If it went to a billion dollars tomorrow, I would not sell a single share because I believe that the father son who run it are really good capital allocators. The son is really young. He's actually very gifted and and they're very creative. And I think that they will continue to add value. So I believe in 10 or 20 years, that company might be worth 5, 10, 15 billion. Who knows, right? I own 35%. I just want to sit on that 35%. And so if it gets to 500 million, that's fine. But we're not selling billion. We're not selling billion and a half today. We'll think about it. But below that, we have no interest. And even billion and a half, I'm not sure I'll sell. Two billion, I'm out of there today. <laughs> but uh, but uh, but I hope it doesn't get there because I think it's got a much longer runway, long term, and such. So so I think that what what I'm uh, really focused on is finding businesses that have great managements, very protected monopoly like products, great uh, returns on capital, and then seeing how that overlays with the country. And sometimes we'll make mistakes. But in general, you know, humans vacillate between fear and greed. When you get extreme greed, you get extreme mispricing in one direction. And when you get extreme fear, you get extreme mispricing in the other direction. This is the nature of option. The, the warehouse operator, which was sitting at $20 million, they could sell one single warehouse in the next 10 minutes for 70 or 80 million. The largest warehouse would probably get them 70, 80 million like that. And I think they told me that they sold two warehouses, one of the largest one and the second mid-sized one out of 82, two out of 82, the debt would go to zero. So they would, they could just take the count from 82 to 80 and private buyers will just pay them what it's worth. You're not even going to look at the stock price. And, uh, and, and it's anyway, the whole business is not available. You know, it's not available for sale. You could buy it in the market fractions, but you can't buy the whole business at that price. So, so I think that it is in the nature of auction driven markets that they can vacillate quite widely. And, you know, if you look at any business, uh, look at IBM, New York Times or any publicly traded company. Just look at the 52 week range on that stock. It might be like 50 to 120 or 70 to 120, something like that. But if you look at a, your own home, how much does it change in a year? What's the lowest it goes in a year and the highest it goes in a year? You know, more, recently we had some movement, but in most years it's like less than 5%. It's like nothing. So, but if that home were a stock, publicly traded, it would go all over the place. So the same asset as a listed company will behave very differently than it behaves as an unlisted private asset. And so because of that fluctuation, we can do well. I would not be do well in Turkey if there wasn't a stock market. If I had to go negotiate individual Deals like if I went to this company and said, "Hey, I'd like to buy all your warehouses," they'd say, "Well, at a billion, it's not for sale." Okay, you know that'd be their answer to me. You know, warm regards. You know, <laughs> so 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 the, it's really the auction-driven markets that give us that opportunity. You talked about auction-driven markets and how they can create uh, greed and fear. Um, where do you think that we are now in general, Monish, um, with the U.S. markets? Um, could you peg us on one side or the other? Well, I don't think the markets are in bubble territory. I think that there are slivers of the market that are in bubble territory and have very weird mispricing. I think the whole crypto thing is a bubble. Uh, I think that, you know, the, the meme stocks are bubbles, you know, AMC and GameStop and all of those. I think those are bubbles, but I don't think the bubble extends to more than like 10 or 15 stocks. 
you know, it's a small area of the market and maybe crypto is another area of the market that has bubble-esque characteristics. And I don't really need to be wrong or right on that because I'm not going and shorting those, right? But I, but I would say that it's not clear to me Tesla's overvalued. It's not clear to me, you know, Google is overvalued or anything like that or Apple's overvalued. Those are very strong businesses and they could be strong for a long time. And in a low interest rate environment, those earning streams are worth a lot. So I think for the more, but I don't think they're in bargain territory. So I would say that the US markets for the most part are not in bubble territory except for a small sliver, but it's very hard to find things that, that are 50% off or 70% off. I think those are few and far between. And that's why I spend more time in places like Turkey, because I think a lot of rationality has gone out the window. Can it be as simple as PE ratios when it comes to value? What is your interpretation of how, how you can apply a PE ratio for a value of a business? Yeah, a PE ratio is not very useful. They can be a company with trades at four times earnings and it's overvalued. And they can be a company with is trading at 80 times earnings and it's undervalued. So the issue, the correct way to value a business is to understand what kind of future cash it is likely to produce over the next 5, 10, 15 years and then discount that back. And um, so a 4P company might be declining, for example, you know, melting ice cube. The earnings are going down 50% a year, for example. And or in negative territory. And it may not be worth even one time zones. You know, so uh, whereas some business is growing 40% a year and it deserves to be at 100 multiple because it's just got so much strong tailwinds for such a long period. And so what we want to do as investors is we want to look at no-brainers. We want to look at things where we don't need to do a DCF. Where now I'm not going to find things like my Turkey example. I mean, in, in 30 years or 29, 28 years as an investor, I don't think I found other than that one at like 4% or 3% of liquidation value. It's happened once in 30 years or once in 28 years. Okay. But you don't need it to happen more than once or twice. Okay. If, if that business gets to be a $3 billion or $5 billion business in 10 or 20 years, we're done. It doesn't matter what else we did and how wise or stupid we were on other bets. This bet alone would carry us. You know, it's, if it's a 10% bet and it does that, you know, 7 million becomes a billion or something. You know, we are 100 bagger. No problem. Now, how does a deal like that come across your desk? Is this you going through filters? Well, or? so when I went to Turkey, there are the good news with the videos people like you put out is there are fans of Monish globally. And the thing about these fans of Monish is like some of these guys, uh, like my, my friend in Turkey, they are running value funds. They are very well versed in the in the intelligent investor, and they've read about Buffett. Many of them have come to the annual meetings, and uh, and they've some of them have attended my meetings, for example. So, for example, my friend in Turkey runs a fund, and uh, I think he visited California, attended my meeting in like 2014, and I just looked at things that were going on in Turkey that looked look like a lot of a lot of um, fear in 2018. So I, I asked him, I said, look, if I come to Istanbul, could we just visit everything you own? Just visit every portfolio company that's in your portfolio? Because I, I know how he thinks. He's, he understands Graham and I know how he thinks. He said, it'd be a pleasure. I said, then let's do it. And I said, do you mind if I buy stuff that you own? He said, I'm done. You can buy whatever you want. And, um, uh, so uh, I just went with him and spent a week and I just visited every company in his portfolio. And so it's already been through, you know, the shameless cloner mm -hmm. already went through one filter. The guy is smart. 
He's a very smart guy and he's very thoughtful and he knows these businesses cold. He knows the families. He's giving me history about the cousins and the uncles and everything else, what's been going on for 30 years in that business. I mean, stuff that I would never be able to figure out, right? And so I'm bowling with bumpers. It's great to bowl with bumpers. Bowling with bumpers. I absolutely love that. Yeah. Bowling with bumpers in Istanbul is awesome, man. Your website mentions the free lunch portfolio. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. The free lunch portfolio basically is our take at an index with, you know, maybe 15 stocks and just using two or three simple filters, you know, like, uh, one part of the business, one part of that free lunch portfolio is cloned, cloned ideas. Another part is the spawners and the cannibals. So I think that when you just don't have much activity, it only, you know, adjusts once a year. And, uh, and it, there's not many changes that happen even after a year. And, uh, you just let these businesses go. I think it, it does reasonably well. So it's, it's not, we're not doing stock picking there. It's a, Pretty much like an, and it's not a money making enterprise for us. We don't, uh, we don't have that product. And we uh, just put it out there for fun and said to some people, if you want to do this, uh, you know, feel free. But there's no reps and reps or warranties, and well, neither are there any fees. Well, for a newer investor who's learning, it would be a good place to start, right? As a yeah, I think that's a good place to start. The S and P five hundred is a good place to start. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway is a good place to start. I mean, all of these are pretty valid. You run a foundation called Dakshana. Uh, can you tell us about that foundation? Your experience with it, and maybe give us a story that came from that experience. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Dakshana is now uh, it's about. 15 years old it's, uh, and it's worked out way better than I thought. I think in the uh, like 2006, 2007 timeframe, I could tell that uh, the wealth we were building would widely exceed our ability to spend it. And, uh, and the wealth would be compounding because at that time I was like 40 years old or something, 42. So I was very... I would say I was very influenced by a quote of Warren Buffett that he said that I want to give my kids enough money for them to do anything they want, but not enough money for them to do nothing. So clearly large inheritances actually are a disservice to your kids and gene pool. Uh, It's going to make their lives worse rather than better. Uh, Small inheritances, I think can give them a good boost without being a, a negative. So I knew that I agreed with that. I said, I knew that, you know, most of the money would not go to the kids. And so if you are not going to give the money to the kids, you're only left with one choice, which is give it back to society. We can't take it with us. And I did not want to be writing checks to the Red Cross when I was 85 and drooling uh, with half my brain gone. I wanted to try to do in philanthropy what I was trying to do in investing, which is give the money away thoughtfully so it had meaningful impact on society. So actually at that time I started looking for uh, charities that I could write checks to. And I was very deeply disappointed out of thousands and thousands of charities globally. I couldn't find one that I was so impressed with. And the reason is that the people who run charities, they have really good heart. They're not, they're not fraudsters. They are good people, good people with good hearts who want to do good, good in the world, but they have no business mind. And so they are all heart and no head. And to do it properly, you need a Bill Gates. And so you need a balance between heart and head. So you do need to be compassionate and you do need to care about the world, but you need to understand return on capital. And in my case, what I call social return on invested capital, which is if I put money out to a particular cause, you know, if I'm going to pull a homeless man off the street in LA, set him up in an apartment, pay the rent, 
try to get them a job, try to get them rehab, try to get them off drugs. What is the cost of doing that for one homeless person? And what is the impact to society? And how does it compare to, for example, giving needles to drug addicts? So I could give a set of needles to drug addicts. What is the return to society for that versus taking some homeless people off the street? And each of these has versus, let's say, working on climate change. Each of these is good, good things to pursue. The problem that comes up is measurement is really hard. How do you measure? How do you measure whether needles is better or taking a homeless guy off the street is better? And so what I did is I did what Charlie Munger said, which is when you face a tough problem, one way to solve it is to invert it. So Munger always says, invert, always invert. So I said, okay, the inversion is, I'm only going to look at areas of philanthropy where measurement is easy. So anything that is a great cause, which cannot be measured, if something cannot be measured, we cannot actually understand what the return is on the money we're putting out. It may be a great cause, but it, then you just have, you're, run, you're running blind. So I said, okay, we're only going to focus on things which, where the measurements are easy. So we ended up with basically a focus on education, which generally lends itself to metrics you can measure, and a focus on poverty alleviation in, in India. So we identified that we could, India has a situation where there are really good medical schools and there are really good engineering schools, which are run by the government. They're almost free to attend like a top four-year engineering program in, the, in India would be less than $4,000. Same with med school. And the $4,000, any bank will give you a loan. And your first year income will be ten or 15000 So you'll easily cover that 4000 even in one, one or two years. You can pay off the loan, right? So, but the problem is there's a lot of, pressure to get seats in these schools. It's very competitive. And so there's a big coaching industry, which is very expensive to get coached for the entrance exams for these schools. And so the poor people can never get into these schools, even though they're free to attend. So what my foundation did is we set up free coaching for these kids, where if they are very poor and gifted, we bring them in for two years we spend like, you know, two, three thousand dollars per kid on them. And then we have like a 80%, 70, 80% hit rate on them getting to these schools. And these kids are coming from families where the income is typically less than hundred or two hundred dollars a month. And they finish and they are at thousand or two thousand dollars. So that's awesome. What a great so we can so we can measure what our success rate is because a third party tells us if a kid got admitted or not. It's not something we can fudge. We can measure how much we spent. We can measure what they're making. We can measure every single thing. And so if you go on our website, dakshana.org, D-A-K-S-H-A-N-A.org, uh, you can see all our annual reports and the metrics and all of that. And, uh, you know, Buffett, Buffett and Munger both read the reports. They become good friends now. And Buffett has told me that the Dakshana annual reports are the best annual reports he's ever read from any nonprofit, which I'm assuming includes, includes the Gates Foundation. So I take that as a compliment. And it's there because that's what we care about. You know, I, I care about that the money is well spent. And I think we get tremendous bang for the buck. I think for about $3,000, we lift a family permanently which is incredible, I think. And uh, so I think that might be a good note on, uh, on which to end, uh, Tom. What do you say? I think that that's great. Thank you so much for joining us, Monish. It's a pleasure to have you on. And uh, thank you again for coming. I uh, enjoyed the session and uh, look forward to uh, future interactions. Take care. All right. Thank you.